Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg is one of the most well-known politicians in Britain. He is characterized by his distinctive appearance and mannerisms. Regrettably, um, I was explaining why I was delayed for an appointment at 2 o'clock, so I would have the pleasure of being in the chamber. Unwavering conservatism and traditional values. He defends our rights, our traditions and our liberties. His impeccable manners, old world charm and eloquent speech has earned him the nickname the Honourable Gentleman from the 18th century. He is seen as the quintessential English gentleman, which can be traced all the way back to when he was just a boy. Disgraceful. Absolutely disgraceful. Rees Mogg is a Member of Parliament, representing the constituency of North East Somerset, where he is a strong advocate for Conservative policies, making him a polarising figure in British politics, drawing both admiration and extreme criticism. He's also an investment banker, having amassed considerable wealth, something again which can be traced back to his childhood. Because you need money, um, and with money you can make more money. But something which has also clearly defined his life in British politics is his Catholic faith. I'm actually going to church. He rarely holds back when defending the teachings of the Catholic Church or using the teachings of the Catholic Church to defend his views on various issues. Are you completely opposed different. to abortion in all circumstances? Um, yes, I am. Rape and incest? Sexual violence? I'm afraid so. Really? Life, life is sacrosanct. I've come to Westminster in London to meet Jacob Rees-Mogg to find out more about how a man from an aristocratic English family developed such a strong Catholic faith and the impact this has on his life and politics today. Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg, it is great to meet you and thank you for doing this interview. No, it's an absolute pleasure and thank you for inviting me. You have just been awarded a knighthood for 40 years of service to political life here in the United Kingdom, a kind of departing gift from Boris Johnson. What was it like to receive that? Well, it was very unexpected. Boris uh, rang me up some months ago and said he was doing his dissolution honours and uh, would I like a knighthood? And I said, oh, how extremely kind of you, thank you very much. And it's characteristic of Boris to be kind and generous to his supporters. Because your father received a knighthood as well. He did indeed, uh, from Margaret Thatcher for being, he was editor of the Times for many, many years, so basically he got it for journalistic service. When I was reading the articles about you receiving the knighthood, that mixed response, you know, on one hand people saying, congratulating you, very well deserved, and then I was reading other articles where they were saying this is a disaster, this is an embarrassment. Do you read the criticism? Do you think about the criticism? I, I think when you think about political honours, they're not the same as honours that are given to people who have worked in the community or in charities for decade after decade. They are a recognition that people have been involved in politics and they have been supporting a Prime Minister who has an incredibly difficult job to carry out and they've been supporting somebody who is trying to do his best for the nation. Uh, and that is something that will inevitably be politically controversial. So when politicians get knighthoods, whether they're Labour or Conservative, there will be people who say, how awful. But it's the system we've got and uh, I think it's a rather good system. But does it affect you, the, the praise and then the criticism? Do you take it in? No. One, uh, it's the line from Kipling, treat these two impostors both the same. I, if I walk along the street, I'm quite often stopped and I'll be stopped by one person who says, hurrah, and one person who says, boo, and one shouldn't take either of them too seriously. The other night we were out in uh, London, there was a group of maybe 10 or 12 of us, and when I told everyone uh, I'm here and I'm going to do an interview with Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg, the reaction was instant and it was strong from everyone at the table. And um, I, I was thinking about that divisiveness. Why do you think you are such a divisive figure here in the United Kingdom? Well, the whole setup of British politics is adversarial. Look at the House of Commons. We sit opposite each other. Look at our law courts, where we have an adversarial system where somebody goes to argue the case against somebody who's arguing the opposite case. And it's a clash of ideas, clash of beliefs. And this is really important. It's what makes our political system work. And I'm part of that. Of course, I'm uh, involved in one side of the argument, which I put as strongly as I can, and others don't like it. Do you love it, that argy-bargy? Oh, I think it's essential to politics. I think it's essential to creating good ideas. I think consensus in politics is a disaster because you find that you get um, soggy, soft views that don't change anything ever. Why did you get into politics originally? So it's a very good question and, and, and mixed reasons that um, 
there is an element of public service. I think that if you are interested in politics and feel you can contribute something, particularly if you come from a fortunate background, you do have an obligation to do something in return, but I also enjoy it. So it's not, I, I wouldn't like to say it's all piety, it's actually it's a fascinating thing to be involved in. I find it a very rewarding and interesting. But when did the political bug bite? Was it from a very young age you thought, I want to aspire to this office? It's, it's, it's difficult to be precise. Um, I was certainly interested in politics from a young age. That. Um, my father was a newspaper editor and we were very political as a family in terms of our conversation and our guests and so on. Uh, and then when I was only about 10, Margaret Thatcher was elected and I thought she was absolutely amazing, remarkable, um, uh, charismatic leader who changed the country for the better. You were drawn to that strong character in Margaret Thatcher. And actually, I saw the great footage of you that I know everyone has seen here in the United Kingdom when you were around 12 years of age and your dad at the dinner table with you. And he was always interested in your opinion as well, even though you were just a kid, about what you thought of what was happening politically in the country at the time. I, I think this was a very important part of my growing up, that um, my father thought that the views of his children were interesting and worth listening to. And I take exactly the same view of my children, that, that um, you, you want to have family discussion and you will only have good family discussion if you're willing to listen to the views of the younger members of the family. Four decades in politics, Jacob, what has surprised you the most? Is it what you expected it would be, this game of politics? Well, I think the thing that surprised me most is simply the pace of politics since the mid-2010s, from 2015, you get an unexpected election result, you then get Brexit, you then get the Conservative Party changing leader as often as most people change their shirt. Um, on and on it goes, and, and it's the pace of politics that has picked up in the last few years. Mm. Is it getting, you know, we, we look at the United States and the divisiveness of politics and uh, people are just in their camps entrenched more and more. We see that happening here, uh, this side of the pond as well. Is it changing for the better, for the worse, do you think? It's very important to try and get some form of historic perspective because we always think the politics of our day is the most divisive that it's ever been. It isn't always true. Politics in the 1980s between uh, Margaret Thatcher and the miners, for example, was extremely divisive. Um, some of the things Disraeli said about Gladstone would not be parliamentary nowadays, that they would be thought to be absolutely um, extreme and beyond the limits of polite political discourse. If you go back to the rows with Charles James Fox and Pitt the Younger, I mean, on and on it goes. Politics is important. That's why it's divisive. How the country is governed matters. And so, yes, of course you want to argue your point strongly. And I wonder if people look back at previous decades quite sentimentally mm. and say, oh, goodness, 20 years ago everyone loved each other. Did they really? Yeah. Were they being quite so nice about their fellow politicians? Now, we are here today interviewing you for EWTN because of your strong Catholic faith. And you have always been outspoken about your, your faith and your beliefs and citing the Catholic faith to defend very controversial and complicated issues, political issues, societal issues, and so on. Where does that strong faith come from? Oh, it comes from my father uh, via his mother, uh, who was Irish-American and broke up with a very strong Catholic faith and say that, that, that um, because some people are quite surprised that somebody who appears to be as English as I am isn't uh, is uh, an uh, Anglican but yes. is, is, is in fact a good solid papist um, uh, and that's through my, my father as I say uh, his mother. Growing up of course when you're a child it's cultural it's what you do on Sundays it's just part of the family life uh, when did you start to think about it more seriously and m more in depth? Um, well, when I was a child, I didn't enjoy going to church. Really? As my children don't always enjoy, that, you know, um, staying at home and playing was rather more fun than, than going off to Mass. But I've been very lucky. I've never not believed it to be the truth and that the teaching of the Catholic Church is the truth. And therefore, as I've got older, it's um, become more important to make sure that one fulfills one's obligations to the Church. That steadfastness, where does that come from when we look at religion, all religions kind of declining in the Western world? Um, 
and, and everywhere you look, the noise is that it's old fashioned, it's outdated, we don't need it anymore. But it's what St. Paul says um, if Christ raised from the dead, then it is true. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, we're all wasting our time. Mm. And I've never doubted that Christ raised from the dead. I, I, I can think back to going to um, the Good Friday liturgy. And really, when I was very little, being absolutely convinced of the truth of what was being revealed, and everything flows from that. So you take transubstantiation, which lots of Catholics um, fret about, and can that really be happening? Mm. Well, yes, because if Christ rose from the dead, the miracle of turning bread uh, into the body of Christ in its inner substance is not difficult. Mm. Every, yeah. Everything depends upon the resurrection. But you, you understand it on an intellectual level, or you feel it like inside, in your inner being, in your soul? I, I think um, uh, faith comes first, and then you look at the history of the church and the intellectual development of the church. And why do I find it easy to accept the teaching of the church uh, on matters of faith and morals, where the area where the church is infallible, according to Vatican I? Well, because the best thinkers of the last 2,000 years have devoted themselves to working through what the church thinks, how it has understands what has been revealed to it. Um, who am I to compete with that? What about through your formative years, when you're looking at the world around you and young people are questioning everything and their place in that ever-changing world? In those years, did you look around and think, uh, maybe this is hogwash, maybe this is a fairy tale? No, I've never thought never. that, no. When the scandals broke here in the United Kingdom, the sex abuse scandals in the Catholic Church, as they did in my neighboring country, in Ireland, and in all many different parts of the world, did that rock your faith and belief in the church as an institution? No, because all institutions are made up by individuals, and individuals are fallible. What are the words said aloud in the canon of the extraordinary form? Only words said aloud, nobis quoque peccatoribus, and us two sinners, even the priest, is admitting that he is a sinner. Because of course he is, because he's human. And we know that only Christ himself and Our Lady were without sin. And so you know that, but that doesn't undermine the institution, which is Christ's institution. In political life, how does your Catholic faith influence you? Well, I'm very lucky. I think, I think being a Catholic makes political life much easier because there is an authoritative body of teaching that I can point to if I'm asked about the moral questions, um, which are in British politics a free vote. Uh, and so if somebody says to me, what is your view uh, on abortion, for example, I can say, well, the teaching of the church is, and I accept that as a Catholic. And why is this helpful? Well, it means that if people want to challenge my view, which of course they're entitled to do, and they do do, they're not just challenging me, they're challenging um, the authority of the church, which is a much greater authority than I could possibly have. Do you think your Catholic faith has been a hindrance to you or held you back in political life here? No, I don't think it has. Um, I think that British society is very tolerant of um, religious faith. There's that famous moment when you were on breakfast television here in the United Kingdom. I mean, this is morning TV when things are a bit softer and breezier. But Piers Morgan, the interviewer, uh, put it to you about the issue of abortion, which is legal here in the United Kingdom. And he, he said to you, what about in the case of incest or rape? You know, these horrific uh, crimes. Would you support abortion in those cases? And you strongly said, I'm afraid, no, is the answer. Now, many politicians could have seen that as game over, the end of their political career. Like in that moment when you're there, do you think, I have a choice to say what I politically might help me and be popular, or what I believe in? Like, is that a difficult position for you to be in? Um, you're kind enough to assume that I was thinking it through. I just was asked a question and I answered it. I hadn't given much thought to my answer. I'd I don't buy that for a second. It's true, because I, I was expecting to talk about Brexit. So, and I don't like early mornings. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm not at my sharpest <laughs> early already morning. Off so, so I was expecting to talk about Brexit. Um, uh, Piers Morgan asked me about um, abortion and I answered with the teaching of the church. Um, uh, I, I did think as I left the building that this wouldn't necessarily enhance my political career, but it actually didn't make any difference. But you must come up against that 
a lot because many of the teachings of the Catholic Church go against, and the beliefs of the Catholic Church go completely against the grain of society at the moment and, and what is popular. So do you find yourself in a difficult position when you are faced with something, maybe even in your own party, that you have to support that the party is pushing an agenda or backing something, and you think, well, this goes against my core beliefs as a Catholic? Fortunately, all these issues are a free votes, so there is um, no great difficulty in maintaining um, an orthodox Catholic position. There's much debate now around religious freedom and, as an extension, religious tolerance. But the case that was a big story here in the United Kingdom of the, the woman who was arrested for praying silently in her mind outside of an abortion clinic, I mean, that was a big story in the United States. They couldn't believe this. But something like that, does that worry you when you see that woman who wasn't shouting or protesting but yet was still arrested for praying in her mind? I'm very worried about the freedom of speech issues more generally. I, I think this is part of a freedom of speech issue rather than a specifically religious issue. Uh, it is cropping up in a number of areas. We've had a recent um, argument about people having their bank accounts closed down because they had political views that the banks didn't seem to like. Uh, and so freedom of speech is, is coming up again and again and that that's a real challenge. I, I wish um, we had the First Amendment in the UK. It would make things much clearer. Mm. Do you think the government got it wrong uh, with that bill that, saw, that has allowed like, that lady to be arrested? It was a free vote. Mm. So, so that's the problem. That, yeah. that, um, it, it's very interesting. When you look at the abortion issue, um, in opinion polls, 70% of women would like to see the limit for abortions reduced. In Parliament, it's almost an article of faith of the Labour Party that you should have almost abortion to full term. That the people arguing for decriminalisation, what they really mean is abortion to full term. And the left are much further away from where public opinion is than they think they are. But they are unfortunately uh, a majority in the House of Commons. When you look at the state of the Catholic Church in the United Kingdom today, what do you think? Um, what do I think? I think the Catholic Church uh, is doing reasonably well. We've been hugely helped by so many people coming from Poland, which has sway swelled our numbers, which is a thoroughly good thing. Um, you mean in terms of attendance? Or in terms of attendance and numbers. Okay. So, so we've got, yeah. um, we've got I, I, I think, highly of um, the Cardinal, Cardinal Cormac, uh, not Cardinal Cormac, Cardinal Nicol. Um, I heard him preach. That was a wonderful sermon. I went to... Uh, the Red Mass, which is a mass at the beginning of the judicial year. And you know he's very gentle, kindly man. And he got up with all these judges there. And he said, you may think you're very important, you judges. And of course you are. Very, very important. <laughs> Wonderful fellows. But there's a higher, more important judge than you. Just you watch out. It was fantastic, tough stuff from somebody very gentle. So I'm, I'm, I'm an admirer of, of, of his. And if you look at some parts of the church, they're really doing very well. So um, if you look at the Brompton Oratory, mm. it is, is full and people seem to like rigorous orthodox faith. The Institute of Christ the King, again, with rigorous orthodox faith, doing very well and getting lots of vocations, as they do at the Oratory. Yeah, why do you think that is that some areas of the Catholic Church in pockets are thriving, whereas the vast majority of the church has seen a decline, a very steep decline? I think it's a question of doing things properly. I think where things are done properly, this is attractive to people. It's about truth. If the Catholic Church believes it is the holder of truth, it needs to be bold about this, doesn't it? And if it doesn't believe it's the repository of truth, well, what's it fussing about? So it's all down to the belief in truth. As someone in political life looking at society as a whole, what do you think the effect has been on society as we have seen the decline of religion? I think there are problems. Um, and I, I think religion provides a very secure base for people's lives. Um, uh, I, I think that it is um, helpful for them in terms of their mental health. I think a religious faith gives people a purpose and a, um, a, a spiritual understanding of life that helps them mentally. Um, I think it also encourages people to behave well. Though I, I've always rather liked the um, line of Evelyn War. Um, people said to Evelyn Moore, Mr. Moore, how come you're such a difficult man when you're a Catholic? To which you reply, just think how much worse I'd be if I weren't. And I've always rather felt like that, that um, it helps us be a little bit better than we might otherwise be. How has it helped you in your life? 
Oh, it, it helps me in my life on a, a, a daily basis. Having a belief in something that is um, more important uh, for, for, for the next life uh, is um, extremely helpful in focusing on, on what matters in life. Are there moments that you can remember where you had to lean into it more or was there to comfort you? No, I, well, I, I, I suppose um, it's a great comfort when people die because one believes that they are going to something greater. Your father, he passed away in 2012? That's right, it? that's yeah. right. Uh, you think about him every day? Today? Oh yes, of course I do, and pray for the praise of his soul. Of course I do, and have Mars said for the praise of his soul uh, at least once a year. Yes, of course. Um, but my father died in the strongest possible faith. He was ready to go, uh, and that was really rather wonderful. Again, going back to that video that I have watched, and so many people in the UK, your UK audience would have seen of you when you were 12, and I think it was French television came over. Was it French TV that did a documentary? Was, makers? Yes, yes. Yeah. And you were in the back of a car, and you were saying, I, I, I really like money, because yes. uh, you need it to buy things, and I'm investing money. You were investing money at 12, and you were interviewed on the BBC, and you found out afterwards that there was a contribution fee of 18 pounds, and they hadn't paid you it, and you sent them a letter at 12, saying if they didn't pay you 18 pounds in 10 days, you'd take, get legal advice. Did you get the 18 pounds? Uh, yes, I did, and you remember, <laughs> these things, you remember these things far too well. I'm afraid I, I have not watched this thing that I did when I was 12. I don't um, necessarily dig up everything I did in the past. But you, from a young age, you had this, you came from a very uh, wealthy background, but you had a fascination with money and uh, work now in investment banking as well. And I know if you, on the internet it says Jacob Rees-Mogg is, is worth a hundred million pounds. If only. Today. This is regrettably absolute nonsense. But how has money changed you as a person? Well, I, 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 it's a very hard question. Um, I enjoy working um, and th that is very often remunerative, but I, li I like working. Um, I would say I'm much less focused on money now than I was when I was a 12-year-old. Your priorities have changed. Yeah, yeah. I, I, th I think with um, six children and um, uh, politics, the, the, the politics is different. Politics is not about money. Politics is about changing the country for the better. And actually, that is in its way, um, in almost every way, more rewarding than um, bank balance. The people here who say, oh, Jacob Rees-Mogg is out of touch because of his vast wealth and uh, his demeanour. And I know once you were saying you were a man of the people, but you said it in Latin. Yes. <laughs> that, 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 that may be considered to have been an attempt at humour, which is never very successful politically. That, uh, that it's very dangerous business for politicians to try and make even the most roundabout joke. Um, what would I say to that? I'd say that, first of all, uh, we have a great system in this country of constituency surgeries. So almost every week, my constituents come and see me and tell me about their lives. That's how you remain in touch. The second thing I'd say is that nobody is in touch in this way. Nobody leads anybody else's life. Nobody else knows how somebody else is really living the life that they are living. So I've always thought this man of the people stuff is pretty much humbug, and that people try and pretend they are. It's the, the old story about um, Harold Wilson. Harold Wilson, former prime minister, uh, when he was on telly, would smoke a pipe. When he was out of the camera view, he would smoke a cigar. So he pretended to be a man of the people for the telly, but he enjoyed the finer things in life when he was away from the telly. Not that anyone's allowed to smoke nowadays on television anyway, but... but uh, Are you thinking of lighting up now? Or? Uh, no, I've, I've never been a smoker. But the, being authentic and staying true to who you are, is that something you've always tried to do throughout your political career? Wait, I haven't really tried to do anything. I mean, it, it always, you make it sound as if it's all been carefully thought through. I, I've just sort of muddled along, really, and I've never thought I'd be very convincing trying to pretend I was somebody else. Because I've heard you quote before that biblical phrase, you know, what does a man profit if he gains the world but loses his soul? And again, back to those times when you have to make decisions, do I say what I really believe in when I know on Twitter I'm going to be destroyed for this? Or in the, the oh, newspapers the next day. Twitter. I mean, for heaven's sake, <laughs> I, 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 the, 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 the Twitter is an absolute relevance, um, and, and Twitter storms shouldn't be taken seriously. The, the but isn't that the issue today? They are taken seriously, and sometimes uh, even an editor at the New York Times resigned a few years ago and said Twitter had become the ultimate editor. That what was going viral or what was the trend in Twitter was what was getting into the mainstream media. Then I think people should rise above it and not be too snowflakey. Uh, I, I really don't think Twitter matters and that people expressing that anger on Twitter um, 
shouldn't be taken too seriously. It's like somebody sitting watching telly at home and saying, oh, I could throw a brick through the telly. They're not really going to. They don't really mind. The next morning they've forgotten about it. I wouldn't take any of that uh, too seriously. But in politics there are always compromises, particularly when you're in ministerial office, because not every decision goes the way you want it to. Um, but what you do is you make your argument and you accept collective responsibility, unless it goes too far, at which point you have to resign. So, um, whilst I was minister, we had all the lockdowns. Um, after the first lockdown, I was not enormously keen on them. I wanted them to um, be eased and not to be reimposed and so on. I made the arguments. Uh, I didn't win them. Um, should I have resigned over it? Well, no, I think not, because I think you needed some people in government who were making those arguments. And ultimately, when it came to the, the final Christmas, we didn't lock down because there were some people in government making those arguments. They may have taken a time, um, but all things end eventually. Looking back on four decades political life, what are you most proud of? Oh, um, uh, uh, what I'm most proud of are the things I do in North East Somerset that help individual constituents. I had the most wonderful experience in the last election um, in a village called Poulton where I knocked on a lady's door and I said, hello, I'm Jacob rees -Mogg. I'm a candidate for the Conservatives, I wonder if I can count on your support the election. And the lady said to me, yes, of course you can, because you helped get me this house which I'm now living in with my two children. And when you do something by writing a few letters that changes somebody's life for the better, that is the most rewarding part of politics. Um, that the, um, uh, it's, it's, those, it's those sort of things that, that, that really matter. Any regrets? Um, well, I, mean, I think one just has to get on with things. I, I'm, I think sort of stewing over one's errors is not necessarily very useful. And of course, Holy Mother provides confession, so then one can be absolved. <laughs> but you're human, do you look back and think? Oh, always thinks one could do things better, of course, yeah. yes. But I'll leave those to confessional rather than to public television. That's a show for another day. <laughs> um, so Jacob Rees-Mogg, thank you very much for doing this interview. Thank you for having me, it's been a pleasure. Thank you.